The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. Madam President. Oh. Senator from South Carolina. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I believe our nation is in desperate need of a family conversation. The American family as a whole needs to sit down, come to the same table, and talk with our relatives. That means each of us talking to each other about the challenges that we've seen in our nation over all of last week. A challenging week in America's history, without any question. A challenging time period in Americans all over this country, without any question. Protests, riots, challenges that we haven't seen in a very long time. We stand here today, Madam President, at a crossroads. Our nation is experiencing turmoil we haven't seen in generations, decades since we've seen this type of turmoil all around the country. My heart breaks for all of us. This week on this floor, I will give a series of speeches in hopes of illuminating some of the issues before us, as well as what I believe are essential steps toward closing both the wounds newly opened and others that have actually never healed. In other words, Madam President, there are wounds that have existed for more than a generation, and it's time for the American family to work together to heal some of these wounds. Last Friday, deep in the heart of Texas, we saw both the best and the worst of humanity. Only in America would you see police officers alongside protesters who were protesting police brutality. And in this scene, if you just take a step back and just picture if you would for just a moment, Here's a scene of police officers protecting protesters who are protesting police brutality. And in this picture, we don't see tension or animosity. We see smiles. We see police officers working, taking pictures, and making sure that everyone was having the appropriate time. And for some, even an enjoyable experience with law enforcement. But then, the shots rang out. Police turned very quickly to protect those protesters, and protesters helped police identify where the shots were coming from. Somehow, at the exact same time, Dallas came together. And at the exact same time, was torn apart. In what appears to be one man's warped mind, retribution became his answer to frustration. And his hate left five police officers dead and seven other officers wounded. We continue to mourn for them and their families today, Mr. President. We must not, we must not become a society where revenge is the rule of the day. Our nation is dependent on the rule of law. And to enforce the law, we need honest, hardworking men and women to take up the shield. For the overwhelming majority of cops, it's a calling, it's not a job. It's in the fashion of Romans 13, a chapter that speaks very clearly about the fact that government officials wearing a sword can be ministers. And in other words, sharing love and affection and appreciation for those that they guard and having the ability to 
provide punishment when necessary. We're talking about men and women who work for a very low wage all over the country who see their job as a calling. And so many of them, the vast, vast majority, do it so well. Law enforcement officers simply want to do two things, Mr. President, protect and serve. We cannot allow the actions of a few to overwhelm the good of the majority. To illustrate this, I want to share just a few stories so that we can put in, put in frame, put in focus uh, the sacrifice and the commitment that so many officers exhibit every single day throughout our nation. My first story is a story of a young lady named Jillian Smith, a young African-American female police officer from just west of Dallas in Arlington, Texas. In December 2010, Officer Smith responded to a domestic violence situation. She arrived and met an 11-year-old girl, beautiful girl, and her mother. Both fearful, these, uh, I just want to stop for a moment here and make sure that we get the, the frame. Here comes an officer, Officer Smith, who shows up to make sure that the folks who called them were safe. The people they called were an 11-year-old girl and her mother who were fearful that the mother's boyfriend would show up and do something dangerous. And dangerous, he did do something incredibly brutal. Officer Smith, hearing gunfire, in an instant, jumped on top of the body of the 11-year-old. And as the bullets rang out, she kept herself on top of that 11-year-old girl. Uh, the girlfriend's boyfriend would end up killing the mother and then killing himself. But before he did so, he killed Officer Smith. But without a second thought, without a second thought, Officer Smith did what so many law enforcement officers do instinctively, protect those who are exposed. Officer Jillian Smith, a true American hero, gave her life, gave her life to protect the life of an 11-year-old girl she had never met before knocking on that door. You see, Madam President, this story and other stories aren't unusual. They just want to serve and protect. And we saw this same heroism last Friday evening, as told by Shatamia Taylor. Ms. Taylor was at the protest. She was there exercising her first, her first constitutional right. And then the sniper started shooting. Ms. Taylor came there with her four sons. She, for the lack of a better word, freaked out. Bullets flying. She ran to cover her one son. And before she knew it, according to her recount, her account of the situation, before she knew it, there was a cop who, were, who was covering her and her son. And then the next thing you knew, another cop at her feet, another cop towards her head. She in the midst of a sniper shooting at cops, found herself surrounded, covered by police officers, just doing their job, risking their life for this mother 
and her son. What a picture. The best of America, very clear. The sniper, the worst of America, just as clear. Ms. Taylor made a very good point when discussing what happened. Here's her quote. She said, these are the people you call when you're in a situation. What are we going to do if they stop policing? Let me ask the question that Ms. Taylor asked one more time. What are we going to do if they stop policing? Who are you going to call? These are the stories that should give us faith in law enforcement. So while we certainly have issues that demand solutions, and I too have had some issues with law enforcement that I'm going to share in my next speech on Wednesday, These, I will be giving three speeches. This is the first one. The next one, I'll talk about some of the issues that so many folks have, have experienced. I want to spend time on that, but this is a moment in time when we should stop the camera, create a frame, let's focus on the fact that our law enforcement officers are true American heroes, period. When you're looking for a hero, sometimes you look for athletes, maybe not the best place. You look for entertainers, maybe not the best place. You look at Congress, 9% approval rating, probably not the right place. But our men and women who put on a law enforcement uniform, these folks, are real American heroes. And I'll tell you, in my state, South Carolina, officers like Greg Aaliyah gave his life last year in Columbia, South Carolina. Officers like Alan Jacobs gave his life in Greenville, South Carolina. And in Charleston, Joe Matiskolovic, who was killed by a man shooting through a door. Body slumps over. And, and my mentor, who I've spoken about for so long, John Moniz's son, I call him a brother from another mother, was the first deputy on the scene who dragged the lifeless body of his friend, his colleague, from that door, trying to get that body completely out of harm's way. You see, to me, as I said a few seconds ago, Brian Moniz and the sheriff's deputies and police officers, those are our heroes. And we should focus on that for a moment. We must come together. We must find solutions. We must get to a point where the American family, our family, has a real conversation about the things that divide us, the differences of our experiences, but yet remain a single family with a single mission and make sure that every part of the American family feels valued. I'm starting tonight with our law enforcement, uh, the part of the family that we depend on, as Ms. Taylor so perfectly stated. And if we do, have this necessary, painful conversation as an American family, we can say 
with a new freshness. God bless America. We can say with new focus to our American heroes, God bless our law enforcement community. I will tell you, I, I don't expect to give such a speech without having some folks respond positively and, and some even negatively. But this night, this day, knowing that tomorrow in Texas, our current president, our former president, and a number of folks throughout the state of Texas will be together in a part of our family territory celebrating the sacrifices, mourning the loss, but doing something that needs to be done. And it is simply this, Madam President, not coming as a Democrat, not coming as a Republican, not coming as a black American, not coming as a white American, not coming as an Hispanic American, but coming to a family gathering for a family funeral, plural, which hopefully will start a family conversation that I will look forward to continuing on Wednesday. Madam President, I thank you. Mr. President. The Senator from South Carolina. Mr. President, I rise today to give my second speech this week discussing the issues we are facing as a nation following last week's tragedies in Dallas, Minnesota, and Baton Rouge. This speech is perhaps the most difficult because it's the most personal. On Monday, I talked about how the vast majority of our law enforcement officers have only two things in mind, protect and serve. But as I, as I noted then, we do have serious issues that must be resolved. In many cities and towns across the nation, there's a deep divide between the black community and law enforcement. A trust gap, a tension that has been growing for decades. And as a family, one American family, we cannot ignore these issues. Because while so many officers do good, and we should be thankful, as I said on Monday, we should be very thankful and supportive of all those officers that do good. Some simply do not. I've experienced it myself. And so today, I want to speak about some of those issues. Not with anger, though I have been angry. I tell my story not out of frustration, though at times I have been frustrated. I stand here before you today because I'm seeking for all of us, the entire American family, to work together so we all experience the lyrics of a song that we can hear but not see. Peace, love, and understanding. Because I shuddered when I heard Eric Garner say, I can't breathe. I wept when I watched Walter Scott turn and run away and get shot and killed from the back. And I broke when I heard the four-year-old daughter of Philandro Castile's girlfriend tell her mother, it's okay, I'm right here with you. These are people lost forever. Fathers, brothers, sons, some will say, maybe even scream, but they have criminal records. They were criminals. They spent time in jail. And while having a record should not sentence you to death, I say, okay then. I will share with you some of my own experiences or the experiences of good friends and other professionals. I can certainly remember the very first time that I was pulled over by a police officer as just a youngster. I was driving a car that 
had an improper uh, headlight. It didn't work right. And the cop came up to my car, hand on his gun, and said, boy, don't you know your headlight's not working properly? I felt embarrassed, ashamed, and scared. Very scared. But instead of sharing experience after experience, I want to go to a time in my life when I was an elected official and share just a couple of stories as an elected official. But please remember that in the course of one year, I've been stopped seven times by law enforcement officers. Not four, not five, not six, but seven times in one year as an elected official. Was I speeding sometimes? Sure. But the vast majority of the time, I was pulled over for nothing more than driving a new car in the wrong neighborhood or some other reason just as trivial. One of the times I remember I was leaving the mall. I took a left out of the mall, and as soon as I took a left, a police officer pulled in right behind me. So that was my first left. I got to another traffic light. I took a, another left into a neighborhood. Police followed behind me. I took a third left onto the street that lead, or at the time led, to my apartment complex. And then finally, I took a fourth left coming into my apartment complex, and then the blue lights went on. The officer uh, approached the car and said that I did not use my turn signal on the fourth turn. Keep in mind, as you might imagine, I was paying very close attention to the law enforcement officer who followed me on four turns. Do you really think that somehow I forgot to use my turn signal on that fourth turn? Well, according to him, I did. Another time, uh, I was following a friend of mine. We had just left working out, and we were heading out back to grab a bite to eat about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And he pulls out, and I pull out right behind him. We're driving down the road, and uh, the blue lights come on. Officer pulls me into the median. And he starts telling me that he thinks perhaps the car is stolen. Well, I started asking myself because I was smart enough not to ask him. I asked myself, uh, is the license plate coming in as stolen? Uh, uh, does the license plate match the car? I, I was looking for some rational reason that may have prompted him to stopping me on the side of the road. I also think about the uh, experiences of my brother, who became a command sergeant major in the United States Army the highest rank for an enlisted soldier. He was driving from Texas to Charleston, pulled over by a law enforcement officer who wanted to know if he had stolen the car he was driving because it was a Volvo. I do not know many African-American men who do not have a very similar story to tell, no matter their profession no matter their income, no matter their disposition in life. I also recall the story of one of my former staffers, a great guy, about 30 years old, who drove a Chrysler 300, a, a nice car, without any question, but not a Ferrari, not a super nice car. He was pulled over so many times here in D.C. for absolutely no reason other than for driving a nice car. He sold that car and bought a more obscure form of transportation. He was tired of being targeted. Imagine the frustration, the irritation, the, the sense of, of a loss of dignity that accompanies each of those stops. Even here on Capitol Hill, where I've had the great privilege of serving the great people of South Carolina, 
as a United States Congress member and as a United States Senator for the last six years. For those who don't know, there are a few ways to identify a member of Congress or Senate. Well, typically when you've been here for a couple of years, the law enforcement officers get to know your face and, and they just identify you by, by face. But if that doesn't happen and you have a badge, a, a, you know, a license that you can show them, shows that you're a senator, or this really cool pen. I oftentimes say that the house pen is larger because our egos are bigger, so we need a smaller pen. So it's easy to identify a U.S. senator by our pen. I recall walking into an office building just last year after being here for five years on the Capitol. And the officer looked at me, a little attitude, and said, the pen I know, you I don't. Show me your ID. I'll tell you, I was thinking to myself, either he thinks I'm committing a crime impersonating a member of Congress, or, or what? Well, I'll tell you that later that evening, I received a phone call from his supervisor apologizing for the behavior. Uh, Mr. President, that is at least the third phone call that I've received from a supervisor or the chief of police since I've been in the Senate. So while I thank God I have not endured bodily harm, I have, however, felt the pressure applied by the scales of justice when they are slanted. I have felt the anger, the frustration, the sadness, and the humiliation that comes with feeling like you're being targeted for nothing more than being just yourself. As that former staffer I mentioned earlier told me yesterday, there is absolutely nothing more frustrating, more damaging to your soul than when you know you're following the rules and being treated like you are not. But make no mistake, no matter this turmoil, these issues should not lead anyone to any conclusion other than to abide by the laws. I think Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said it so well. Returning violence with violence only leads to more violence and to even darker nights, nights, to paraphrase, without stars. There is never, ever an acceptable reason to harm a member of our law enforcement community, ever. I don't want anyone to misinterpret the words that I'm saying. Because even in the times of great darkness, there is light. As I shared Monday, there are hundreds, thousands of stories of officers who go beyond the call of duty. Ms. Taylor, as I spoke about on Monday night at the Dallas incident, was covered, covered completely by at least three officers who were willing to lose their life to save hers. We have a real opportunity to be grateful and thankful for men and women in uniform. I shared another story on Monday night as well. And while the one I want to tell you today does not involve a tragic loss of life, it does, show, so it does show support that meant a lot to me at the time it occurred. Prior to serving in the United States Senate, I was an elected official on the county level, on the state level, and a member of the United States Congress. I believe it is my responsibility to hang out, to be with my constituents as often as possible, and to hear their concerns. So at some point during my time as a public servant, I traveled to an event that I was invited to, along with two staffers and two law enforcement officers. All four were white and me. When we arrived at the event, the organizers seemed to have a particular issue with me coming into the event. He allowed my two staffers to go into the event, seemed to be allowing the two officers to go into the event 
who both said they weren't going in if I wasn't going in. And so in order to avoid a real tense situation, I opted to leave because there's just no way of winning that kind of debate ever. But I was so proud and thankful for those two law enforcement officers who were enraged by this treatment. It was such a moment that I will never forget uh, in a situation that I would love to forget. Now this situation that happens all across the country, this is a situation that happens all across the country whether we want to recognize it or not. It may not happen a thousand times a day, but it happens too many times a day. And to see it as I have had the chance to see it helps me understand why this issue has wounds that have not healed in a generation. It helps me to appreciate and understand and hopefully communicate why it's time for this American family to have a serious conversation about where we are, where we're going, and how to get there. We must find a way to fill these cracks in the very foundation of our country. Tomorrow, I will return with my final speech in this three-part series on solutions and how to get to where we need to go by talking about the policies that get us there and people solutions. Because I, like you, Mr. President, I don't believe that all answers are in government. I don't think all the solutions that we need starts in government. But we need people doing things that only individuals can do. Today, however, I simply ask you this. Recognize that just because you do not feel the pain, the anguish of another, does not mean it does not exist. To ignore their struggles, our struggles, does not make them disappear. It simply leaves you blind and the American family very vulnerable. Some search so hard to explain away injustice that they are slowly wiping away who we are as a nation. But we must come together to fulfill what we all know is possible here in America. Peace, love, and understanding. Fairness. Thank you, Mr. President. The Senator from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise today for the final time this week. This has been a very emotional 10 days for all of us, and I believe a pivotal time for the future of our nation. For me, personally, I believe our brightest days are still ahead of us, and I'll tell you why. I'm a kid who grew up in a single-parent household, mired in poverty, disillusioned at times, who nearly flunked out of high school, whose life was changed by a strong, powerful African-American mama, and an optimistic, visionary Chick-fil-A operator named John Moniz, who happened to be white. Why do I say this? I think it is incredibly important that while our problems appear in black and white, our solutions are black and white. My life is a testament to God's love, a mother's love, and the love of my mentor. I don't deny that our nation must have tough, painful conversations, family conversations. But I have experienced what's possible when the family talks, and it's really a cool thing. My life story is a story of second chances, a love story of sorts. It's a dark hour in race relations for America. But I bring you hope, real hope. In the Deep South, with a provocative racial history, the voters of the first congressional district of South Carolina, a heavily white district, the home of the birthplace of the Civil War, elected the grandson of a man who picked cotton. I want to say that one more time. 
In the heart of the South, the home of the Civil War, a majority white district, these voters elected the grandson of a man who picked cotton over the children of the former United States Senator and presidential candidate Strom Thurmond and a very popular governor, Governor Carol Campbell. I am hopeful because, as, because I have experienced the power of a state that has been transformed, the great state of South Carolina. So to my American family, please remain optimistic. On Monday, I discussed the importance of supporting our law enforcement community. I followed on yesterday by asking all of us to also realize that although the vast majority of our law enforcement officers only seek to protect and to serve, there is still work to be done. There is a lack of trust between the black community and law enforcement. One that we as an American family must come together and solve. I believe an old saying is a vital part of finding solutions. The only way to know where you're going is to know where you've been. As I mentioned earlier, part of the rich and sometimes provocative history of America is to point in one of two directions. One is to realize that over the past 240 years, we have had our challenges. Our nation has nearly been pulled apart. But out of the crisis of our past has come the hope for our future. In a relatively short amount of time, we have made, in my estimation, remarkable progress as a nation. And while I'll talk about a few of the policies I believe will help us move forward, as well as some things that are more about simply getting us to interact together, to sit down and break bread, the one thing our collective history has taught us is that we must not lose hope. Yes, there are unresolved pain, suffering, and misery, but this is the greatest nation on earth, and we are the greatest nation on earth for a reason. Flawed men at our foundation opted to sacrifice themselves on behalf of other flawed men. And together, we have done something unique in the history of our planet. That is simply to create a country that is based on the premise that all men are created equal and that our path forward will be, pla will be blazed together. As the book of Joshua says, we have to recognize our memorial stones so that we have a chance to move forward. So there is obviously no single solution here. I hope to share a few today, some of which I have talked about before, some of which have broad support in Congress, and some that have nothing to do with the federal government. Believe it or not, the government is not the answer to what ails us. We can help in places, but the good news is 300 million Americans, we as a nation, as a family, we are the solution. The first section of solutions sits in the realm of law enforcement and the Justice Department. Over the past few years, I have talked to a wide variety of officials from across the law enforcement arenas, as well as groups like the Urban League, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and many other groups. One solution that seems to be acceptable and almost exciting to so many folks is the notion of body cameras. So I've introduced my Safer Officers, Safer Citizens Act, which provides more resources for police departments to obtain body cameras, as well as to help pay for some of the startup costs for storage and other requirements. While we know body cameras cannot be the panacea, we also know this. 
If an officer is wearing one, we have a much better chance of understanding the situation from all sides. This is why so many law enforcement officers and agencies support using them. It's why you're seeing from cities from Los Angeles to New York outfitting their officers with more and more body cameras. I've also introduced the Walter Scott Notification Act, along with my good friend, Senator Grassley. Our system for tracking police shootings, it's not working for our nation. It's a patchwork system not built for the 21st century. So long story short, this bill changes that. Hopefully it fixes the problems. We must know where we are to know where we must go. I'm also glad to see my colleagues in the House, including my very good friend, Congressman Trey Gowdy, starting a bipartisan working group to take a hard look at the relationship between the black community and the law enforcement community. I am very hopeful that a similar group will start in the Senate. And my final point on the federal level is that I have had the pleasure of working with a group of colleagues, John Cornyn and many others, working on this notion of criminal justice reform. And I'm very hopeful that that work will continue and to move forward and produce real fruit. Much of this work that needs to be done won't be done on the federal level if it's done by the government. It will be done by the local government and the state government. I've talked to so many in the law enforcement community who talk about the need for more training, specifically de-escalation training, diversity training, and more efforts to get police officers out of their cars and into communities so that they form positive, healthy relationships, so that when they're walking down the street that the folks know them. I, I spoke earlier with Senator Langford, who talked about this notion of getting officers embedded in communities so that the officers know the very people they're talking to. This seems like common sense and it seems like the right direction. It's a two-way street. I think the Dallas police chief said it very well. He made the point better than I could ever say it. He said, if you have issues with policing in your neighborhoods, well, we're hiring. <laughs> That's really important. Dallas Police Department, along with police departments all across this country, they're hiring. They said, and he said, we'll train you up and we'll put you back into your community. These are the sort of real world solutions and actions that build trust in communities. The second set of issues we have to tackle, and this is no surprise to anyone who's heard me over the last couple of years, focuses on one specific word. The word is opportunity. Too many communities in our nation feel like they've been left behind, like no one cares. So why should they care? As someone, as I said earlier, who grew up in a single parent household, I can tell you how strong that sensation to quit becomes, how quickly it grows. When you feel like I felt in the past, frustration rises. You start seeing the world differently. You don't trust people who aren't from your neighborhood. This is a dangerous recipe. So how do we tackle this problem? The answer, from my estimation, is kind of simple. Education, jobs, and investment. The cornerstones of my opportunity agenda. On the jobs front, I've worked across the aisle with senators like Cory Booker to introduce the LEAP Act, which allows for a very successful South Carolina apprenticeship program to become a national model so that kids can earn and learn at the exact same time. We know not, not everyone wants to go or can afford to go to college, but that doesn't mean 
that they should not be able to find opportunities to provide for their families. By incentivizing apprenticeship programs, we can help folks see their potential, experience their potential, and live fulfilling and profitable lives. I've also introduced the Investing in Opportunity Act, which seeks to create a path for private sector dollars, not government dollars, but private sector dollars to be invested in distressed communities. We have 50 million Americans living in distressed communities and over $2 trillion of unrealized capital gains just sitting there. We should incent those dollars to be invested in those communities. Finally, education. My good friend Trey Gowdy says that education is the closest thing to magic in America. I think he's right. You can look at our incarceration rates, our unemployment rates, our high school dropout rates, our lifetime average incomes, and they all point to one specific area, educational achievement. Trust me, I'm the guy that just told you I almost failed out of high school. I know this firsthand. For me, the answer is very clear. Give parents a chance to find the best school for their children, and they will, period. And finally, the solutions on a personal level. Again, I turn to Dallas. As I was watching uh, one of the surgeons at Parkland Hospital, he was talking about his feelings towards law enforcement. Uh, he was saying that he was struggling the night after the shooting. He had worked all night trying to save the lives of these officers. And he was tossing and turning, torn up on the inside, that he could not save their lives. Uh, I can't imagine how he felt. I can't, Dr. Barrasso, a surgeon, imagine how he felt trying to save the lives of men, women, who are willing to give their lives for others. I can't imagine. But he was an African-American man. And as he woke up and prepared for the next day, he struggled because he struggled with his personal relationship, his personal concerns with law enforcement. So what is he doing? I think this is instructive for all of us. He said he is making sure that his daughter sees him buying lunch for officers, sees them interacting in a friendly way because he doesn't want to pass on to his daughter any sense of fear of law enforcement, but respect, appreciation, and affection for men and women who wear the uniform. I've seen it in my hometown of North Charleston, South Carolina. It's an amazing experience. On Christmas morning, dozens of officers with dozens of volunteers show up at City Hall. And at six in the morning, these guys, gals, go door to door in the poorest neighborhoods in North Charleston. I've been there with them once or twice and they knock on the door and they look into the eyes of a little girl or a little boy who's expecting nothing for Christmas. And they hand that child a toy. There are simple ways to bridge the divide between the African-American community and other poor communities and law enforcement. Powerful ways, simple ways to make a difference. As I've said a couple times, the government cannot make us get along. We've seen it tried before. It just simply cannot force you and I to take the leap of faith, to try to trust again. You know, the, the notion of America is really built on the foundation of faith. Faith in each other. Faith in a higher calling. 
If we are to mend the relationships in our family, we will have to do so by looking into each other's eyes, walking in each other's shoes, and listening. Not waiting to talk, but listening. Listening not only with your head, but listening with your heart. So that you hear and feel the pain and the challenges of others. This is a simple commandment from God's word. It's Matthew 22, verse 39, to love your neighbors as yourself. This is not simply a commandment, however. This requires action. You have to do something. Trey Gowdy, congressman from South Carolina, and I are going to bring pastors and law enforcement officials together in South Carolina so that we can have an honest, sometimes painful conversation about how to move forward together. In Charleston County, I had a chance to speak with Sheriff Al Cannon, longtime sheriff in Charleston. And he simply said that both sides have to come together because this is not a one-sided issue. Senator Langford and I are discussing a new idea called Solution Sunday, a wonderful idea that Senator Langford shared with me earlier this week. And we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks, but the premise of the idea is that you have to do more than just go to church together, and we as a nation aren't even doing that very well. But you have to eat together and do projects together. So you'll hear more about an exciting idea, Solution Sunday, in the upcoming weeks. And I'll continue to reach out to my colleagues and my friends who may not look like me, who may have a different philosophy than I do, so that I can understand their hopes, their dreams, and their frustrations. Because listening is so important. And as we look around our nation, it appears to me that we haven't done nearly enough listening to each other. In closing, I hope we all remember we have survived turbulent times before. The Civil War, the Great Depression, World War II, 1968, and in South Carolina, 2015. I still marvel at how our state responded to the shooting at Mother Emanuel. The power of forgiveness, the power of love conquering hate. Earlier this year, I lost my grandfather. I haven't really talked about it publicly. He was 94 years old and meant so much to me. This was a man born in Sally, South Carolina in 1921. I can only imagine what he has seen in South Carolina. I can only imagine the life, the challenges, and the struggles of an African-American male in the Deep South in 1921, 1931, and the 40s. He didn't finish elementary school. He had to pick cotton. He never learned to read. He eventually got a job at the Port of Charleston. A job that while it did not give us much in the way of tangible resources, it provided an immeasurable lifeline for our family. Now, this is a story that has been repeated generation after generation in this country. I've heard this story from a very different frame from my good friend Marco Rubio. It's a story of success. It's the story of significance. It's the story of America. My grandfather's grandson, yours truly, is a United States Senator. My brother, another grandson, rose to the rank of Command Sergeant Major 
in the United States Army. My nephew, his great-grandson, has graduated from Georgia Tech, Duke University, and now is on his way to Emory for medical school. That's the beauty of America. From cotton to Congress in one lifetime. We are a beautiful nation. We are an amazing family. Families fight sometimes. That's okay. We must remember that we are one single family. We can all get to where we're going. We must get to where we're going. And we will get there together. I want to, one more time, slow down, pause, and remember the sacrifice Sacrifices made by five Dallas police officers. The tragedies in Baton Rouge and Minnesota. We have been through so much, but a bright future is still there for our taking. Let's make sure we grab it together. Let me just say thank you to, to my staff who worked very hard all week long to make sure that we were prepared for these presentations. And, and I want to specifically thank my communications director, uh, Sean Smith, who together helped put most of these words together, helped us work through the emotions, the challenges, and how to frame the conversation that we believe America must have. As my communications director, who happens to be a white guy, my chief of staff, who happens to be an African-American female, as we worked together, it reminded me that in the midst of our struggles, our challenges, our difficulties, that I depend on a rainbow coalition, a patchwork quilt, to present my thoughts, my heart to America. We are America. We are Americans. God has blessed the United States of America. Thank you. Mr. President.